the Buddha taught lots of different meditation techniques, lots of different objects that you can focus on. But as John Lee points out, the breath is the home base. In his terms, the other objects are places where you go foraging when you need special kinds of food, but otherwise you come back home. This is because the breath has all kinds of uses. Working with the breath helps you strengthen the body. There's a story of a John Lee going into the jungle. He was planning to spend the rains retreat. Three days he walked into this one spot. And soon after arriving, he had a heart attack. He realized that the only way he was going to get out was to pull himself together. There was no medicine. There was no way to get doctors. So he used the breath. And it was a result of his exploring how to use the breath to pull his health together that we have method, too. So when you're feeling tired, the breath is a good place to focus. You can think about the different parts of the body that need breath energy that have been starved and give it to them. The breath is also a good place for the mind to grow calm. You think of the breath coming in and out throughout the entire body. Think of your awareness spreading to fill the whole body. It's very difficult for the mind to think when its range of awareness is so broad. It's as if you were going to think about the past or the future. The mind would have to go down these little tubes, and you have to make it small to fit down a tube. But if you think of the breath covering everything in the body and your awareness covering everything in the body. Your hands are nailed down to your hands, your feet are nailed down to your feet. Everything is in place. Then it's very hard to think about the past or the future, and the mind can calm down, at the same time feeling very spacious. You don't want your concentration to be contracted or tightened. Don't think of your awareness being a light that spreads its radiance in all directions. And the breath can spread in all directions, too. Come in from all directions, go out through all directions. This is a stillness that's not constricted and it's not confined. It's a stillness that's wide open. Think of having one center someplace in the body into which everything comes and out of which everything goes. And this centered and broad awareness, as I say often in the directed guided meditations, it's healing for the body, it's healing for the mind. The breath is also useful as, a, as an object for gaining insight. It's an object of mindfulness. And with mindfulness, it's the ardency with which you work with the breath. It gives you a lot of insight into the process of what the Buddha calls fabrication. There's bodily fabrication, the breath itself. It shapes your experience of the body. There's verbal fabrication. Technically, this is directed thought and evaluation. Well, when you're focused on the breath, you're directing your thoughts here, and you evaluate the breath as it's coming in, going out. And you evaluate the mind as it relates to the breath, so you get them to fit snugly together. And then finally, there's mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. Perceptions are the labels you give to things. So for the time being, you just give the label breath to all the energies in the body. And you breathe in a way that gives rise to feelings of ease, both physical ease and mental ease. So when you're with the breath, you're here with all the building blocks of the way you experience having a body and having a mind. When you get hands-on experience with dealing with these things in these terms, that's where insight begins. When the Buddha talks about the various ways of dealing with the breath, the basic pattern all the way through is you get 
sensitive to a particular aspect of how the mind is relating to the breath, either in terms of the breath itself or the feelings that arise from being focused on the breath, or the states of the mind as they relate to the breath. You get sensitive to these things and then you notice how you are fabricating them. The Buddha doesn't say that we're simply passive recipients of things coming in from outside. The minds are actively going out, looking for things to feed on. And the fabrication is how we fix our food. Because the way we feed is the cause of suffering. You really want to get very familiar with how you fabricate things and learn how to fabricate them in a more skillful way. This is what insight is all about. You fabricate the breath, you fabricate your sense of the body through the breath, you fabricate your mind through your feelings and perceptions. The same way you would fix eggs or potatoes or whatever. You can't eat them in their raw state, you've got to do something with them. And it's the same with the things of the world. We don't consume them in their raw state. We have to make recognizable food out of them. Physical food, emotional food, mental food. And then we forget about the process of fabrication. We're cooks at the same time that we're eaters, but we tend to take all the cooking for granted. And just try to eat things up, think the way the world is the way it is, because we've cooked it that way. And a major part of gaining insight is stepping back from your cooking processes and trying to say, well, what are the raw ingredients from which you're making this food? And sometimes it's like those dishes you hear about that the Japanese did at the end of World War II. Here they had these barbarians occupying them. And some of the cooks got their revenge by putting a little bit of human excrement into the dishes they were preparing. And they were very clever, very skilled cooks, and so they could disguise it. And the Americans didn't know they were eating shit. Well, that's the way we feed ourselves sometimes. We feed on all kinds of horrible things, but we fix them up so we think they're nice. So as you're getting used to seeing how the mind fabricates its experience with the breath, you get insight into these processes of cooking, basically, and then you start noticing how you do this with the rest of the world. You can start taking these things apart and say, what is, it, what is the raw material here? Is it really worth consuming? These things we love to feed on. What are they in their raw state? Well, the first thing you've got to do is learn how to tranquilize these processes of fabrication as much as you can. That's the third step in the three major steps in breath meditation. The first two, as I said, were one, getting sensitive to this aspect of your experience, two, getting sensitive to how you're fabricating it, and then three, learning how to calm the fabrication down, calming your breath down making your perceptions and feelings more calm. In other words, what perception of how you breathe is going to make the breathing calmer? What perception of how you are located in the body, how your awareness is located in the body, allows the mind to grow calm? Try to poke around inside and see what those perceptions are. and find which ones are most tranquil. This is how you begin, become more and more sensitive to how much you've been adding to things, how much salt and pepper you've been putting on, how much fish sauce, soy sauce, whatever. Then you can begin to see things simply as they are, or as the Buddha says, as they've come to be. This gives rise to a very strong sense of dispassion, a desire not to need to eat anymore. But to get to that point, the mind has to be strong. This is why you can't do just insight practice. You've got to have the mind feeding off the breath. 
feeding off its concentration, feeding off its mindfulness and discernment. So you can have the strength then to step back from things. Otherwise, if the mind is starved, it's like scientists running an experiment. They've got monkeys in the experimental room, and they've been given a grant to buy bananas to feed the monkeys. But if the scientists are hungry, they'll eat the bananas themselves. So you've got to have the mind really well fed so it can step back and look at this process of feeding from a sense of well-being, from a sense of wondering why you have to keep on feeding. And that's how the mind works its way free. All of this from watching the breath. Now, as John Lee points out, there are other topics of meditation that you may need from time to time. When the mind is overcome with lust, you might want to analyze things down in the body down to the 32 parts, or any other parts that you find particularly effective in putting a check on your lust. Spread thoughts of goodwill or equanimity when you're feeling angry. Contemplate death when you're getting lazy. Not to get discouraged, but to remind yourself you don't have all that much guaranteed time. You do have this moment. The purpose of these contemplations is to get you back to the breath. So try to focus your attention here and see what you need right now. Do you need to soothe the body or strengthen the body? Okay, breathe in a way that makes the body stronger. You need to calm the mind. Breathe in a way that calms the mind down. The mind is tired. Breathe in a way that gives it energy. If you're ready to start developing insight, look into the processes of how you're doing this. So you can understand how the mind goes about shaping things, how it goes about fixing its food. So you can understand this process of feeding, which is such a burden for the mind, even though it is the source of our nourishment. You're trying to find a part of the mind that doesn't need nourishing. But to get there, you need to nourish the mind well with the meditation. And the breath provides a good foundation for all of these things.